Who is says, uh, bowling ball rolls up a ramp. Uh, let me draw this picture here so that I have some uh, concrete thing to imagine and have a thought of. It rolls up a ramp of some height. Okay, good. They are giving me the height. Um, oh, wait. What is its velocity at the top of the ramp? Oh, I don't think it's at the top of the... Uh, so at the top, I don't think it's uh, at rest. So it has some height, H. And it says the bowling ball rolls up without slipping. So apparently I have a bowling ball here, which has some initial velocity of center of mass. Let me call this VCM which is moving with some initial velocity of center of mass. And it has this uh, um, odd phrase, without slipping. And this is a hint to you that a particular condition applies to this motion, that this is what your textbook refers to as rolling without slipping. That's covered in, I think, a section 12.1 and under these scenarios, a particular scenario, a particular condition applies, because what you have to imagine is a circular thing moving in such a way that it combines two kinds of motions. It has this motion of center of mass, and it rolls. It's rotating just enough that this point of contact has a velocity of zero. And under these conditions, what has to be true is that the angular velocity of this round object has to be equal to the speed of the center of mass divided by this distance here, uh, which here would be the radius r. So, so when the question says it's rolling without sleeping, it's telling you, use this relationship. The initial angular velocity of the ball is equal to its velocity of center of mass divided by r. And this condition will be enforced throughout the motion up until when it reaches the top and it's moving at some final speed of v final, we would still have that the angular velocity final is the v final divided by r. So, so we need that. And um, I think that uh, the complete description of the setup. Now, uh, you might be alarmed by lack of information on certain things. It's not giving you what the mass is. It's not giving you what the radius of the bowling ball is. So I'm hoping all those things will somehow cancel out by the time I get to getting to the answer for part A, and we'll see how that goes. So for part A, it's asking, what is the velocity of the bowling ball at the top of the ramp? And um, as you stare at this situation, um, I hope you are thinking through what problem solving strategy you can use. And I hope one of the first uh, strategies that you will consider is a conservation law strategy. If for no other reason, the reason you should consider conservation law strategy is because conservation laws are the easiest problem solving strategy to apply. So there are questions that can be done using conservation law, but um, if it somehow can be done using conservation law, then you should use it because it's much easier than using standard strategy and then kinematics or uh, there are other ways to approach this question, but no other approach is as easy as the conservation law. So, so <laughs> that's the really the biggest reason you should consider conservation law strategy. And once you are there, that what you should think through is what are the conserved quantities? So, so far you have learned three conserved quantities. You've learned of conservation of energy, or more specifically mechanical energy. You've learned of conservation of momentum. And you've learned of conservation of angular momentum. And um, as you are thinking through this, there are conditions that you check. For momentum to be conserved, you need to be able to say that the net impulse due to external forces is zero. And here, I hope you, as you see, that 
as you consider this thing rolling up, that there are enough considerations here that tells you that, oh, there's a normal force here, and there's gravity here, and uh, all that stuff are going to be changing momentum, uh, really, horizontally and vertically. So the conservation of momentum is not going to work. And conservation of angular momentum, that's a little bit harder to see. But maybe one easiest way to see is that you can clearly see that your angular velocity will be changing. So somehow the angular momentum must be changing um, if you are interested in the details. The thing that's changing the angular momentum in this case is the friction force that's uh, applying net external torque that acts over time to change angular momentum. Uh, in, so the in the end the important thing is to recognize that angular momentum isn't conserved and after ruling out those two i hope you can convince yourself enough that the total mechanical energy is conserved um, if you are worried about the normal force and the friction force being there um, the two non-conservative forces the with the friction force this is a static friction force it doesn't actually do any work because the point of contact here, um, where the friction force is acting, there is no displacement there. So this friction force, it does something special. It transfers one form of mechanical energy into another form of mechanical energy, but it doesn't do any work that would, um, that would take out mechanical energy into other forms of energy. So, Again, the important thing is that you convince yourself that energy is conserved. Once you have that, then uh, you can write down this uh, expression. That uh, That's the beginning point of all conservation law strategy problem solving. You say that the total energy as some useful snapshot, let me call this a snapshot one. Total energy at that one snapshot is equal to total energy at this uh, other snapshot. Let me call this snapshot two. Total energy as snapshot two. And then you break down the, the different parts of the total energy and you work through the algebra. So let me first do one thing that I think a really common mistake for people to make um, after you know chapters <laughs> uh, eight and nine. Um, so as you're writing down these expressions for total energy, uh, it's easy for people to just write this, say that, okay, uh, my total energy at snapshot one, no gravitational potential energy, I have kinetic energy. So one half, uh, mass of the ball times V center of mass squared um, is equal to the total energy at the top. Now I have gravitational potential energy, mgh. And uh, from the wording of the question, I feel like this won't be zero. So I have plus one half mv final squared. And um, all of this might seem reasonable to you. You know, you see that, oh, masses cancel out and you work through the rest. And um, when you find the VF through this relationship, plug in the numbers, get an answer, plug it in here, you will see that that's not correct. <laughs> um, it's not going to be correct because you have forgotten something. You have forgotten a form of energy. And this is the form of energy we have to now worry about now that we have covered the chapters 10 and 11. We have to worry about the rotational kinetic energy. So let me explicitly write out uh, different forms of energy that these things can have at different snapshots as you are considering those snapshots. So the total energy at snapshot one, that's going to consist of the potential energy at snapshot one, that's zero plus the kinetic energy will have two parts. There will be translational kinetic energy and there will be a rotational kinetic energy. And it's this rotational kinetic energy that we have forgotten in our previous attempt. And that is going to equal to the potential energy at snapshot two plus again, the translational kinetic energy and the rotational kinetic energy. Oops, that should be two. K 
kinetic energy to rotational. So I need to uh, put these uh, forms in. And I think if we are somehow dealing with, um, so I, I guess what this ends up being is, um, so at the top of the ramp, I think this, will this VF end up being higher than before? You know, somehow it might magically cancel out. Well, you know, I'll have to see. Uh, I, I think when we do this properly, <laughs> it'll end up giving you higher number than um, you might have previously thought. So the form of the rotational kinetic energy is it's uh, analogous to the translational kinetic energy. It will be one half the rotational version of inertia or rotational inertia times angular velocity uh, squared, uh, angular velocity at snapshot one. Um, and for snapshot two, since uh, if it has non-zero final velocity, it'll have non-zero final angular velocity. So this should be one half um, the rotational version of inertia, I times angular velocity squared. So uh, that omega naught, let me just label that as omega, omega one should be omega naught. So, so that's uh, what I have to correct for. And um, now in this expression, you see a lot of unknowns. So let me substitute in some quantities so that we don't have, um, so that we correctly represent how many unknowns we have. One of those unknowns, the rotational inertia, it's something that uh, you have to look up. And uh, as you're looking up, you have to correctly note this is the rotational inertia about the center of mass. This is one of those examples where you break up this motion into movement, translational motion of center of mass and the rotation about the center of mass. So when you are looking at the rotational inertia, it's going to be rotational inertia of a uniform sphere about its center of mass. By the way, um, bowling balls are not uniform sphere, but I'm going to assume it is, it is so that I have a formula I can plug in. Um, so when you look it up, the rotational inertia of a sphere about its center of mass will be 2 fifth mr squared. So I'm going to plug that in into these two uh, terms. And for my angular velocities, omega naught and omega final, I had those expressions above of VCM over R, V final over R, I'll plug those in. So the version of this equation with all these quantities plugged in is one half M VCM squared plus one half, okay, two fifth M R squared times VCM over R squared is equal to mgh plus one half mv final squared plus one half two fifth mr squared times uh, omega final squared. So v final over r squared. And I hope as you stare at this, you see beautiful cancellations. Masses cancel out of every single term. So it's great, we don't need a mass. And another cancellation you get is radius cancels out. This r squared will cancel out this r squared. So you don't need to know the radius. Um, the final result we get, it doesn't depend on the size of the bowling ball. So uh, let me just write down the cleaned up version and <laughs> look at the time. Let me just leave it up to you to work out this v final here. So uh, v final, um, oh, wait, wait, uh, let me write down the cleaned up version of this uh, expression. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, so one half VCM squared, uh, let me just simplify this, plus one fifth um, another VCM squared is equal to uh, GH plus one half V final squared plus simplify this as one fifth V final squared. So out of this equation, one equation in terms of one unknown, solve for the unknown, then you should be able to plug it in here. That's your answer. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and in terms of part B, if the ramp is double the height, 
does it make it to the top? Um, you can approach it in different ways. I guess uh, one way to answer that would be you could just uh, have all this uh, uh, expression and try plugging in try plugging in h equals 1.4 meter um, if uh, the marble one or the bowling ball won't get to the top in the solution step at some point you might run into trouble like a uh, free final squared wanting to be negative that would be an indicator, oh, that height is too high. The uh, bowling ball doesn't have enough energy at the bottom. The translational and rotational kinetic energy combined doesn't have enough energy to get to the top. Um, so that might be a one indicator. Another way you can do is uh, you can uh, do a different version of this uh, equation. Uh, so instead of taking a snapshot at the top, you could take a hypothetical snapshot of the bowling ball at the height of its motion where you can say that the kinetic energies are zero and you can compare that maximum height with 1.4 meter. If the maximum height is greater than 1.4 meters, then yes, it will make it to the top. If it's uh, smaller, then no, it won't. So, uh, so let me leave that for you to do as well. Um, I mainly want you to point out this uh, common mistake that people might make, um, not, count, not taking into account this uh, rotational kinetic energy and um, show you how to properly make, take into account of that.